Yeah. All right, welcome to our final class. We're very thankful that we have Brother Barry who's been to all the station. Thank you very much for coming up to be with us tonight, Barry. Very wonderful subject of prayer. Uh, we're going to ask our brother John Thomas to start with prayer, please. All right. Um, now, Brother Barry has asked that we do a reading from Luke chapter 18. 18. That's, That's one to the four. four. That's and Thank you. Isaac, yes. I'm going to play the one you to stand up and um, lead us in that reading, please. Yeah. So Luke okay. 18, one to four. Then. All right, I'm going to hand over to Brother Barry, who's going to talk to us on prayer. Thanks, Barry. Thank you, Jim, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me um, for your hospitality. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we've got two nights uh, on prayer. So um, next night, uh, what I thought we'd do is probably look at some of the more technical things about prayer and very happy to take on board any questions you've got. Uh, John's already texted me with a question, so we'll, which we'll cover next time. So if there's any particular um, parts of prayer or aspects of prayer you'd like to focus on, um, then very happy uh, next week. Oh, sorry, I think it's fortnight's time, we'll, we'll do that. Whereas tonight, what I wanted to do um, is just look at one element of prayer. And um, as we go through tonight, you might think, what's this got to do with prayer? What, what's going on here? So please bear with me. <laughs> Don't forget I'm an old guy and sort of getting, getting older and having to apply for a senior's card. I believe it, but anyway. <laughs> uh, but hopefully it'll come together tonight, just looking at one particular aspect of prayer that um, that hopefully will be um, encouraging for all of us. Um, so, parables. So we just read two parables, and thank you very much for that impromptu reading. Uh, it was really good. Uh, why, why did Jesus use parables as a teaching tool? Builder. Filter? Yeah, and in what way was it a filter? It was to instruct the faithful and to challenge others. Yeah, very good. In other words, and, and Jesus actually tells us this himself <laughs> in Matthew 13. He actually says, look, the reason I use parables is very much like a filter. For people who are interested in what I've got to say, then it's a way of encouraging them to be even more interested to try and figure out what, what's this about, what's, what's, what's sitting behind this, what's going on here. For people who weren't interested in what he had to say, uh, it would actually make them more disinterested because they just say, this is all gobbledygook, this is nonsense, and I'm out of here. So he actually used parables as a, a, as a teaching tool for that purpose. But one of the questions I have is, Okay, he used parables as a teaching tool for others. But to what degree did Jesus take on board for himself the lessons that his parables were aimed at teaching? You know, were they just simply a tool to help others to either learn or to become more disinterested and, and to filter, as, as Fran said? Or was it actually more to it in terms of, of how those parables actually had a meaning for Jesus, which we perhaps don't think of. Now, the parable I have in mind is, is uh, the parable that we read tonight, the first one, in Luke 18. Now, we're not going to look at this in any detail. We'll look at this next week, oh, sorry, next fortnight, uh, in terms of just trying to flesh out this parable because it's a really unusual one. And the reason it's unusual, it's one of the few parables where we're specifically told what the point of the parable is. Often you read a parable and you think, what's this about? You know, what's, what, you know, you know what, what's it getting at? And you, and you have to sort of try to get your head around what, what it's on about. This actually tells us, verse 1 of Luke 18, he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint, not give up. So we're told right up front, this is what this parable is about. That then people pray and pray and pray and don't give up. Now, you notice it says he spoke a parable unto them. Does anyone know who, who's the them? Who is he targeting with this particular parable? From the previous chapter. Yes, absolutely. So have a look at the previous chapter, verse 22. 
It gives us a clue as to who he was particularly speaking to when we get to the parable of Luke 18, verses uh, uh, 1 to 10. Notice verse 22 of uh, the previous chapter. He said unto the disciples. So it would seem in the flow of Luke's account where it says he spoke a parable, chapter 18, verse 1, unto them, he's particularly targeting his disciples. So this is a, a, a parable that is particularly aimed at helping his disciples to understand something about prayer. And what is it? Verse 1, that men ought always to pray, people, and it's not just males, it's males, females, always pray and don't give up. Uh, as I said, next time we'll look at a little bit more about this parable because um, there's actually a contradiction that comes out of the lesson that Jesus draws which is a really important thing about prayer that hopefully we'll, we'll discover a little bit more next time, but we'll get to that. So that's the parable, and that's what it's about. Pray, 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 don't give up. Now, the next parable that follows, you notice we're told who the audience of the next parable is in verse 9 of chapter 18. This parable, who's it targeting? People who trust in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So it's not so much the disciples, although the disciples could potentially be, be that sort of person who despise other people and, and think they're pretty good. But, but the next parable was particularly focusing teaching tool for, for those who, who thought that they were pretty good um, and others were just rubbish. And again, the theme is about prayer. You notice the next verse, 10, verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. So again, it's the same theme. And so what he does in this parable, he, he talks about two different characters. There's a tax gatherer and there's a Pharisee. And I just want you to notice in passing what happens in verse 13. This is the tax collector. Notice his response. The publican, the tax gatherer, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. So that's his attitude. I'm a sinner. And he smokes on his breast and he says, please, God, forgive me. And so Jesus draws the lesson in verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Not the other person who thought, oh, I don't need any forgiveness. I'm fine. Life's good and I'm good and, and not like there's rubbish people out there. So, so just bear in mind these two parables. Okay. Now, we know from uh, Luke uh, chapter 18, and if you have a look at verse 31, um, that these two parables, which are unique to Luke's account, it seems were given very late in the ministry of Jesus. And the reason we know that, as I said, verse 31, you notice uh, Luke 18, verse 31. Uh, then Jesus took, uh, uh, sorry, then Jesus took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished of him. In other words, verse 32, he's going to be taken, he's going to be crucified, uh, and he's going to be put to death. So that's telling us that this is very late in the ministry of Jesus. In fact, possibly the crucifixion is only two weeks away. So it would seem that these two parables that Luke's giving us, or that, that Jesus is giving us and recorded in Luke's account, were given very late in the ministry of Jesus. In fact, maybe no more than two weeks before he was to lose his life. So, so just bear that in mind. Um, so just bear in mind the lesson, pray, 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 don't give up. Okay, so let's dial forward perhaps two weeks from the events of Luke 18. So two weeks on from when he gave these two parables, let's dial forward and what do we come to? We come to the crucifixion. So let's go to Matthew chapter 27. So we come to the crucifixion. As I said, probably only a few weeks ahead of when those two parables were given in, in Luke 18. We come to Matthew 27. And in verse um, 
37. They set over Jesus' head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. So this is his crucifixion. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. So just bear that in mind because it's telling us that Jesus is right in the middle. So you've got on one hand one criminal, on the other hand another criminal, and he's in the middle. So this is the crucifixion. Verse 39 and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroys the temple and builds it in three days, well, save yourself, you few of the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him, and, and the scribes and the elders said, Ah, oh, he saved others, he can't save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and, and then we'll believe him. Oh, he trusted in God. Well, let God deliver him now, if you'll have him, because he said he, well, he said he was the son of God. Now, notice what we read in verse 39. They that passed by reviled him. In other words, it's telling us this was ongoing abuse. You know, as people came past the cross, they yell out and scream out, the common people and the scribes and Pharisees were out at and the leaders of the Jews were at it, and it was ongoing. It wasn't as if, well, someone just called out once, oh, he saved others, he can't save himself, and then everyone went quiet. They just kept at it. It was ongoing, it was relentless, and it was very cruel, just ridicule, and it's going on time and time again as, as the crucifixion unfolds. Now, what they were really saying to Jesus is, hey, do something supernatural. Come on, come down from the cross, do something supernatural, and then we'll believe you. As if they hadn't already seen supernatural things, like even as they said, he saved others, verse 42. They, they had first-hand evidence that he could save people. They, they'd seen him heal people with, with terminal diseases. They knew he could save, but here they're saying, no, nah, no, nah, we want to see something supernatural. Show us something supernatural, come down from the cross, and, and then, then we'll believe you. And so this ongoing relentless abuse, people walking past the cross, the leaders of the Jews screaming it out, and it's just going on and on and on. And so you can imagine how awful that would be. You see, they had clear evidence that he could say, no, do something supernatural. Come on, come down from the cross and then we'll believe you. <clears throat> Verse 44, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now notice what it says there, the thieves also. So they're giving it to Jesus. So on either side of him, he's getting a mouthful of abuse. So he's getting it from the ground and he's getting it from either side of him and it's relentless, it's going on. Now, for, for, for people to talk in crucifixion, apparently it was really difficult. And yet these two criminals had enough power to, to give it to Jesus, to give him a mouthful and basically saying the same thing as those on the ground. Do something supernatural. Save yourself and save us. So he's getting it from the ground and he's getting it from either side of him. And they've all got one thing in common. They don't believe Jesus. They don't believe that he's the son of God. Come on, come down for the cross. Then we'll believe you. So let's come now to Mark's account because it's reinforced the same thing. Mark's account of the crucifixion. Let's have a look at Mark 15. As I said, you might be thinking, yeah, well, this is, okay, this is about the crucifixion, but what's it got to do with prayer and uh, a particular element of prayer? Well, hopefully we'll get to it. Mark 15, so here's Mark's account of the crucifixion. Uh, Mark 15, verse 29. 
they that pass by are reviled on him. So same thing, passes by. This is ongoing. It's one group come through and more come through, constant. Blah, 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 blah. Just giving them an absolute outcome of abuse and, and ridicule and taunting. So they that pass by, by wagging their heads and saying, ah, you who destroys the temple, you build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Come on. So the same thing. Mark's giving us the same sort of detail, ongoing abuse. Verse 31, likewise also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, he can't save himself. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe and they that were crucified with him reviled him. So it's telling us the same thing. It's just this abuse, this ongoing abuse. We don't believe you. Come down from the cross and then we'll believe you. And he's getting it from either side. Mark's telling us the same thing. Either side he's getting this abuse from those who were crucified with him. And it's relentless. It's ongoing. And, and so... That's what Jesus was enduring. Now, now notice particularly what we just said. Verse 32, that we may see and believe. So again, Mark, as Matthew was doing, he's emphasising one thing. Those on the ground, those being crucified on either side of Jesus, they don't believe. They don't believe him at all. They don't believe he's the son of God, he's anything special. They don't believe. And that's why they're saying, do something supernatural, then we'll believe you. Come down from the cross, then we'll believe you. They don't believe. Let's now come to Luke's account. Because what Luke does is he injects some detail that we don't find in either Matthew or Mark, or John's account of the crucifixion. Luke 23 and verse 33. So here's the crucifixion from Luke's account. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So same detail, crucifixion, Jesus in the middle, two criminals either side. Verse 35, and the people stood beholding and the rulers also with them deriding him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he be Christ the chosen of God. So similar detail, isn't it, to what we saw in Matthew and Mark's account. So he's getting it from down below, he's getting it from either side. But then verse 36, Luke tells us something that neither Matthew, Mark or John tells. Verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. So it's telling us that the Roman soldiers were exactly the same. Now, these soldiers, these Roman soldiers, there was a special cohort of soldiers that was dedicated to crucifixions, basically there to make sure that nothing happened and someone didn't try and get and take the bodies down before they were dead and, and you know, there was a riot. So these soldiers were allocated to crucifixions, which means they were pretty hardened sort of characters. And so Luke in his accounts telling us they're exactly the same as those of the Jews and the Jewish leaders were on the ground screaming out abuse and, and the two criminals either side of Jesus, the Roman soldier is exactly the same. They don't believe in Jesus. Come on down if you're the king of the Jews. Come on down and save yourself. Do something supernatural. Same thing. So it doesn't matter where you go in that crowd, you're getting this common theme. The people, the common people passing by, Jewish leaders, the two criminals, the Roman soldiers, same, same thing. They don't believe that this is the Son of God. And so only Luke tells us this. Verse 39, 
And one of the malefactors, one of the criminals which were hanged, railed on Jesus, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. So Luke focuses on one and says one of the criminals is giving Jesus a mouthful. But, verse 40, the other answering rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, we receiving the due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. So Luke, in his account, says, no, there was only one criminal that was giving Jesus a mouthful, not two. And you say, hang on, hang on, hang on. But, but Matthew, both Matthew and Mark made it very clear both of them were giving Jesus a mouthful. And you, Luke's saying, no, no, it was just the one. And, in fact, the other one, verse 40, was not giving Jesus a mouthful. He was giving the other criminal a mouthful, saying, no, no, no. We're getting what we deserve. Be quiet. And so when you look at this, you think, well, hang on. Um, we've got an inconsistency here. The account of the crucifixion is, is messed up because, well, um, Matthew and Mark both say both criminals were giving it to Jesus. Luke says, no, only one of them did, not both. They think, well, how, how do we reconcile this? Like, you know, like, well, I'm very different. So I guess there's four options. First option is uh, this is a classic case where the Bible has got the detail wrong. It just proves to us that the Bible is a, a, a fiction. It's not true, and you can't trust it. Like, surely, if the Bible is going to get something correct, you get the crucifixion of Jesus, the details to all line up. And the Bible can't even do that, so we could use that as a, a reason to take the Bible and say, no, it's just like any other man-made book. So that, that's one possible option. The second option is that Matthew and Mark were standing well away from the crucifixion. And, and you've got this cacophony of sound. You know, to give an example, the common people would have been speaking Aramaic the Jewish leaders would have been probably speaking in Hebrew. There would have been some in the crowd who were speaking in Greek. And then you've got Roman soldiers, as Luke tells us, who would have been yelling out in Latin. So you get all of these languages and it would have been just total confusion, like this noise. It was ongoing. As we said, it was relentless. And it was just sort of this babble. And so, well, one option is Matthew and Mark, in their account, well, they're standing away from the cross. And they can't quite distinguish who's exactly saying what on the cross. Now, a little bit of evidence for this could be that, that when you look at um, Matthew and Mark's account, when they talk about what Jesus says, they always say Jesus spoke in a loud voice. As if, well, that's the only thing that Matthew and Mark picked up is when Jesus spoke in a loud voice, then they could hear it clearly. But there's this cacophony of sound, and so therefore it was just confusion. And so when they saw the two thieves next to Jesus saying things, they just assumed it was all just abuse. But Luke, well, Luke's a doctor. He's a physician, and he was perhaps able to go a bit closer to the cross, and that's how Luke was able to distinguish the difference. But that's another option. We've got those two options so far. Third option is there was a change. So the third option is Luke's account of the crucifixion in terms of what the, the, these two criminals were saying came first. And then Matthew and Mark's account came later. In other words, initially when the crucifixion started, one of the criminals was actually with Jesus. And he was supportive of Jesus, as in Luke's account. But as the crucifixion wore on and, and the pain and the suffering became so intense, he changed and he gave Jesus a mouthful just like the other criminal. In other words, Matthew and Mark's account came after Luke's account. So the crucifixion started, there was one supporting Jesus, then as, as things dragged on, then, then what Matthew and Mark say is exactly what happened. 
there was a change, uh, and so this 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 criminal turned on Jesus as well. So that's option three. Option four is, yes, there was a change, but Luke's account came last. In other words, initially those two thieves, those two criminals were giving it to Jesus, just like the crowd and the Roman soldiers. But as the crucifixion dragged on, one of them changed. And he went from giving a mouthful to Jesus and taunting him and ridiculing him and saying, I don't believe you, come down from the cross. And he actually changed and became a supporter of Jesus. So there are four options. So let's have a look at those options. Let's have a look at the option number one. Um, the, here's evidence that the Bible's just wrong, got, got it wrong. I think honestly, this actually proves that the Bible is accurate. Like if you wanted to fudge something, you'd fudge this. You'd make sure all of the accounts of the crucifixion all lined up. So, so in terms of the, the, the initial, you know, initially putting the Bible together and they come across going, whoa, we've got a problem, Luke's, Luke. well, hey, Luke's, Luke's different. Oh, we better scrub that out. Not in the original. Oh, right. We just make it all nice and simple and all consistent. The very fact it's inconsistent is telling us that the Bible's actually calling it exactly as it is. And, and instead of being evidence that the Bible got it wrong, it's, it's actually saying, no, well, the Bible's actually got this right. There's, there's been no, no cover-up here, no, no fudging. It's, it's got it right. So, so I think we can discount that. Second option, Matthew and Mark couldn't quite hear what was going on. Luke, because he was a doctor, he could get closer to the, to the crucifixion, to where Jesus was, and could pick up the, the finer detail. Well, no, there's, there's no evidence in that. In fact, both Matthew and Mark must have been close enough because they knew that the man who offered Jesus sour wine, they knew exactly what he said. So so they must have been close enough to sort of pick up, well, this one individual who, who offers Jesus wine, sour wine, when Jesus said, I thirst, they could actually pick up that detail. So it's telling us, no, no, Luke, no, no, Matthew or Mark weren't sort of so far away they couldn't hear what was going on because they picked up that detail and that certainly wasn't said in a loud voice. And that was one man amongst a whole crowd of people who were screaming out. So, so no, that doesn't, that doesn't, Harry, that doesn't fit. The two options, the last two options where there's a change, I think we will see from the evidence that Luke's account came last. In other words, initially the two criminals were giving it to Jesus, but as the crucifixion progressed, there was a change. And one of them flipped. And instead of abusing Jesus and ridiculing him and saying, do something, show something supernatural, save us, save yourself, he actually changed. And so Luke's account came after Sorry, I'll just try and catch up to where I'm up to. I think the key is that there's two things that are clear about this repentant criminal in Luke's account. Uh, notice what he says to Jesus. Verse 42 he said to Jesus, Lord, oh, sorry, this is uh, Luke, sorry, Luke 23, verse 42. He said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, notice that. Firstly, he addresses Jesus as Lord. Earlier on, he was using Lord in a derogatory way. Oh, if you're the son of God, if you're the Lord, come down from the cross and save yourself. Now he's not using Lord in that way at all. He's using Lord as a term of respect. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And notice how much he understands about Jesus. 
Notice verse 42. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. In other words, this, this repentant criminal understands that Jesus is going to come again. He understands that, well, if Jesus is going to come again, he has to be raised because he's going to die. He's on the cross and he's going to die. Therefore, he has to be raised to life. And if he's going to remember me and I'm going to be there, it means there's got to be a resurrection for me as well. So he's got this enormous amount of knowledge. And so he, he says, when you come again, remember me. In other words, there's going to be a judgment. And when you come, you'll come in your kingdom. So he understands that Jesus is going to come as a king. He's got an enormous amount of knowledge. He understands the gospel. Now, there's no evidence that Jesus preached all of this on the cross. In fact, as we said, it was very difficult to speak in crucifixion. But what it's telling us is that this, this criminal brought all of this knowledge to the crucifixion. And yet there was one thing that he didn't bring to the crucifixion, as we saw in Matthew and Mark's account, he didn't believe. And yet in Luke's account, there's a change because it's saying now he does believe. So he brought all of this knowledge. He didn't bring belief. But now there is belief. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. So, so there's this amazing change in, in this particular person. And so what does Jesus say to him? Verse 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you today, now, you'll be with me in paradise. You see, I think that's evidence to say Luke's account came after Matthew and Mark's account. Jesus would not have said that to this this thief, this, this criminal, if he was aware that he was going to flip and change and then turn on Jesus afterwards. And the very fact he says to him today, now, it means Jesus knows the end is very close. So it's an indication that Luke's account of what actually happened in the crucifixion and the change that happened actually came right towards the end of the crucifixion. And so now you've got this, this criminal who brought this enormous amount of knowledge but no belief to the crucifixion and he's gone through the crucifixion and they're getting towards the end and, and now there's a change and now it's not just knowledge but it's converted into belief. Why? What changed him? This is phenomenal. Like he had this phenomenal knowledge, getting abused like everyone else, and now he's changed. What changed him? Well, we're not specifically told, but there is detail in Luke's account that's not found in Matthew, Mark, or John's account of the crucifixion. It's unique to Luke, and it's unique in several ways. What's the difference? We'll just have a look at Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. This is the verse we looked at. And notice particularly the immediate setting. When they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So notice how verse... 33 ends, and then verse 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So verse 34 is unique to Luke. And there's something else unique about what we read in verse 34. I'll just read now from the Emphasized Bible, which is a little bit more of a literal translation, and notice the difference. So just have a look at verse 34, and this is the Emphasized Bible. Jesus kept saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Do you know of all the recorded things that Jesus said on the cross, what we have in verse 34 
are the only words he repeated. I find that amazing because I think, well, you look at, you know, the recorded words, and I would have thought what's in John's account of the, God, uh, of the crucifixion, that's what Jesus would have repeated. And, and what John says is Jesus said, I thirst. And I can imagine Jesus saying, I thirst, I thirst, I thirst, I thirst. And John says, no, he only said it once. He didn't repeat that at all. Verse 34 is the only thing that he repeated. He kept saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so what was happening as the crucifixion happened, it was playing out like an echo in reverse. You see, what was coming from the ground and initially from either side of Jesus was abuse. Saved others, can't save himself. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Ah, come down from the cross and God will have you. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But every taunt, it was getting a response. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And all of this torrent that was coming from both the ground and the Roman soldiers and from either side of Jesus, it's this repeated response, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What an amazing scene that would have been. And this plays out. Every torrent, every abuse, the ridicule is getting this amazing response. The question, what was Jesus doing in verse 34? He was praying and praying and praying and not giving up. That's the parable that he'd given just two weeks earlier. Yes, it was directed to his disciples, but he's actually living it out. He was praying, Father, forgive them. Don't, Father, forgive them. And, and, and he just kept praying and he didn't give up. And the impact, well, the impact is now you've got a criminal who's saved. Initially a criminal who had all this knowledge but no belief, and now because of what has happened on the cross, there's been a change. And so now you've got a repentant criminal. As we said, initially, as Mark and Matthew's account, initially this criminal did not believe in Jesus. And, and what was he asking Jesus to do? Show me something supernatural. Do something supernatural. That's what he was initially saying to Jesus. And you know, that's exactly what he witnessed. You see, it's not supernatural for someone who's been crucified who is righteous, they've done nothing wrong, and, and this criminal, he knows that. You notice what he said back in verse 40, 41? This man has done nothing amiss. This criminal knows that Jesus is an innocent man. So he's an innocent man, and the thief knows this. This criminal knows that he's an innocent man, and he's getting all this abuse and, and this ridicule. It's not natural to respond, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In fact, it's It's supernatural. And that's what the thief was asking for from the, the beginning. And in effect, that's exactly what he got. He saw behaviour that is just supernatural because Jesus was praying and praying and praying and not giving up. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that is also what Jesus had prayed in verse 34. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now you've got a repentant thief and there's forgiveness, but not on the basis that he didn't know what he was doing. He knows exactly now what he was doing. We're getting exactly what we deserved and this is a righteous man. And so the repentance was actually based not on not knowing what I'm doing, but now realising how stupid I'd been. I have all this knowledge. I didn't believe and now I do believe. And so his repentance was actually based on what he did know that was translated into belief, not just knowledge. Verse 41, as he was said, he knows that Jesus was an innocent man and that he was rightfully dying on the cross because he'd done the wrong thing, but Jesus certainly had not. And it doesn't stop there. 
Because what happens next in the crucifixion is that there's a period of darkness. And Matthew, in his account, tells us there was also a, a, an earth tremor. So this is all happening. And notice what Luke says in Luke 23 and verse 46. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the spirit. Now, when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly, this was a righteous man. That's a bit of a weird response. But I can understand the centurion saying what Matthew and Mark in their accounts record, he said. He said, surely this is the Son of God. Like, you know, there's darkness and there's an earth tremor. It's got to be, this is the Son of God. I can imagine him saying that. But Luke says, no, he also said something else. Notice what Luke says he said. Certainly this was a righteous man. Where have we heard that before? In this little scenario. Who said exactly the same words? Jesus. Sorry? Terrible. Yeah, that's a bit earlier, but, but in the crucifixion, who said in effect the same words? <laughs> the repentant thief. Notice what he said in verse 41. This man has done nothing amiss. He's a righteous man. And this centurion comes to the same conclusion. And think, how'd you get to that century? How did you get to the point where you think this, this man has done nothing amiss? He's a righteous man. Exactly the same as the thief. Well, presumably, it was the same as the thief. The thief had listened to what Jesus kept saying repeatedly on the cross, and he came to the conclusion, this is a righteous man. And this centurion comes to the same conclusion. Now, you imagine how difficult it would have been for a centurion. So he's a Roman. He speaks Latin. And that's, you know, he's there. He's got to control the mob. And, and he, he doesn't necessarily speak Hebrew or Aramaic or might speak a little bit of Greek. And, and he can tell what the crowd are on about. And they're screaming. And he said, oh, that's all abuse. But what's he on about up there? Father, forgive them. Well, what's he saying? I, can someone interpret for me? And he keeps saying it. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And this, this centurion, he's Latin, he has to get an interpreter, say, what's this? What's he saying? What's he keep repeating? And he just keeps going and going and going. I don't believe this. He comes to the same conclusion. So by Jesus praying and praying and praying, well, now we've got a repentant criminal. And now we've got a Roman centurion going, whoa. You see, this prayer actually was very effective and it didn't just stop there. Notice what we have in verse 48 of Luke 23. And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. Where have we heard that expression before? The public in that parable two weeks earlier. You see, what had happened on the cross, and in particular what it seems that Jesus has done in, in repeating these words, it's had an impact. You've got now a criminal who's saved. You've got a Roman centurion who's going, whoa, and you've now got the crowd saying, hey, similar response to what we saw in that particular parable. Imagine for a moment, just try and picture this in your mind, as the events of Luke 23 and verse 39 to 40 played out. So just try and picture this. So he's Jesus. He's in the middle. Got two criminals on either side. He's getting all this abuse from down below. Soldiers, leaders, passers by, all giving it to him. And you imagine as the events of verse 39 started, one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on it. And you can imagine Jesus hanging there. Here we go again. 
Uh, just waiting for it to come in. Yeah, save yourself. And, and Jesus is going to respond, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he's probably up there and thinking, right, I'm going to get it from the other side now because that's what I've been getting all along. Yes, and so the criminal is going to give it to me now. And, and whoa, what does he get? Verse 40, he gets this other criminal no longer abusing him but publicly defending him. This is the first public ally Jesus has had in all the crucifixion. The first time he's actually had someone publicly on his side. And imagine he's, he would have just been, whoa, like getting ready to get another earful as I've done all along. And no, he's actually getting a changed response. And for the very first time in the crucifixion, Jesus did not have to respond to someone yelling something at him with, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's the first time because now he's actually got someone who's actually publicly on his side and a changed man. So, so pray, 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 don't give up. And that's the lesson I think that Jesus is demonstrating here of that very parable. Let's just conclude by coming to Luke 18. And uh, let's just have a look at Jesus' final lesson from that particular parable. Luke 18. And verse 8, as he's wrapping up the parable and, and the lesson of the parable, as I said, we'll look at this, uh, God willing, next class. But you notice the end of verse 8. <laughs> Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes... Shall he find faith on the earth? And the question is, well, what are you talking about, Jesus? Faith, what, what faith are you talking about? That's what it is. What's the faith Jesus is talking about? Here? What's the context of the parable? What's the lesson of the parable? Pray and not give up. That's the faith he's talking about. In other words, when I come, will I find people with the faith, the belief, the conviction to pray and pray and don't give up? And it seems that that's going to be a real challenge for those living at the time when he comes. It's so easy to give up. So easy to say, no, it's just not working for me. It's doing nothing. God's not interested. He's not listening and just giving up. The very demonstration of what happened on the cross and Jesus praying and praying and not giving up. I think it's 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 a lesson for us to say, well, look, if Jesus saw that as important and valuable and, and you can see what it can do, then don't give up in our prayers. So any questions, I will leave it at that. Sorry if I've gone a bit long, I apologise. Um, if you've got any questions or comments, please feel free to.